the Perfect Churches podcast. I'm here with um, Jeremiah and Christine. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're just here to talk about you and just kind of how you got into escape rooms. Can you kind of walk us through, first of all, I guess, where your escape room journey began, whether as a player or you know, even a creator? Well, certainly as a player, uh, we discovered, so we discovered escape rooms in uh, 2014 when we came back from our honeymoon. We had just gotten married, we came back from our honeymoon, and we got an advertisement for um, for what we thought was a haunt. It was June, but we thought it was a, a special, because uh, they were promoting The Purge 2 at the time. Oh, okay. And uh, we thought it was gonna be a haunt. So we were like, cool, a haunt in June for The Purge movie, fantastic. And we showed up and it wasn't a haunt at all. It was an escape room in the back of a truck trailer. With an actor. With an actor. With an actor. With two actors, oh, actually. Oh, wow. Interesting. Um, one, one, the girl that had been kidnapped, and then Big Daddy, because it was Purge 2. So okay. the premise of Big Purge 2, Big Daddy would run a truck, and so you've been captured by Big Daddy. And it was public games. And it was public games. So Which we happen to know the person yeah. that we booked and got put with. Right. I had worked with her on a TV show. So she was like my personal trainer on a TV oh, wow. show that I had done for like a weight loss thing. And yeah. so I was like, oh, hey, this is, what are we doing? Cool. Okay. We're going to go and, and be scared together. But back then it was all public. All games were public. We didn't know any better, you know, because from then on all of our games were public up for another like two years, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we, we walked in. We're like, what is this? It's amazing. We didn't get out at all. I don't even know. We got know, shot. But we got shot. We at the end. The um, it's been long gone, so it's not gonna spoil anything. But the end, when you don't get out, the end, they throw you to the back of the truck. A window drops down, and you see the machine gun and the lights and the sound. Yeah. and you all get shot at the end. Did and anything was, like? I'm just probably a stupid question. Did anything like actually hit you? Was it? No, no, it was just like no, no it was just just lighting okay, effects. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, I was like, dang, that was a but still, it was incredible, and like, and you hear the purge sirens going off, and the whole experience was pretty mind blowing. Right. I don't know if it would be anymore. I don't know. It was all in the back of a semi truck um, trailer, so it would be pretty mind blowing. Yeah. The way that they used the layout, it was really cool. Right. Because it was still at least four rooms, if not five rooms, that they well, figured was a out. Cell oh, and the yeah. kitchen, and then the next room was like the thing with the dogs and the switches. Uh -huh. And then there was the one and with the, the computer freezer. and the thing above it. And then there was another path that we didn't go because we didn't get that far. And then there was the. The little room with the thing, all in the back of a semi truck. That's crazy, but it was incredible. With four of us shoved in there yeah. together, right? <laughs> and then up to that point, and an like, actor. Have you heard of Escape Room? No, or that was no. Just kind of like we never, at this point it. in 2014, we, nobody had heard of Escape Room. Well, somebody had because Caden had built one. Caden's, <laughs> but Caden's opened just shortly after that because we were at Caden's right after because Caden launched. So Caden from the basement, mm -hmm. wonderful creator, wonderful. You know, and his part. part of the community. Yeah, Caden and Russell. Don't forget about Russell. Um, but they they were the first to really bring, I think, purely immersive um, escape rooms to SoCal. And they're part of the reason that I think SoCal is as strong as it is. Right. Um, it wouldn't be that way if it wasn't for Caden. Um, but yeah, he, he had the idea. He, he knew, he saw it, and he created the basement. And that was our second. So we, we met him um, after the purge truck, um, and he was excited to show us the basement because he felt that the purge truck lacked some things that he thought was really important. That's crazy. Um, it lacked a little logic. It lacked a lot. There was, there was some yeah, guessing was, involved in that yeah. game. But the game, yeah. But it was but, so fun. Who but cares? that was it. And we were, and from, from then on, we were hooked. Right. Um, it was absolutely incredible. We both come. Um, I, you know, I moved to LA to 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 write. Um, so, and she's an actress. So we come from storytelling uh, is kind of something that we really enjoy, something that we really enjoy being part of, and the idea of being able to be um, part of your own world um, and watch a story unfold and and be part of it and and have the challenge of saving your life. You know, and that was really the first. I don't know, the first 20 games we played were all that same situation. It was all this idea that you've been captured by a killer, yeah. and you had to get out. For some reason, the killer left a bunch of locks everywhere. 
<laughs> Except Leon's game. Except for Leon's games. They were very different. <clears throat> there was this game that we played early on that is one of our favorite games to like love hate, I guess, relationship with this game. <laughs> where um, it was just a guy who was like, he worked for NASA, you know, just a hobbyist of puzzles and things. Yes, right. And um, he created a business in like one of those little spaces at a strip mall. And at one point we showed up and he hadn't even paid his electric bill, I think. Uh, we played with a flashlight from the time we got in the lobby. Oh wow. It's all that like challenging mode he or did. something. He said, there's no lights, but guess what? You get to play challenge mode. There and he answers the There was no like electric needed in the game. Right. Well, they weren't high tech yet. Right. And so we, I had to use the bathroom with a flashlight too. But um, I, we went in and we played the whole game with a flashlight. It was all little locks and stuff. And right. he's the one who taught us that you can guess the fourth digit of a four digit. Cause we only had the three answers and we asked for a hit. And he's like, you have the three. You just ask, you just try things for the fourth. And we were like, that's not how puzzles work, right? right. And then the next game we played with him, we got locked in a small room with a heat lamp. Treasure Island, that was first. We played that before. Did because we? Treasure Island was what the Groupon was for. So we got a Groupon for this we game. Got, oh, and it was for like money. eight bucks. I mean, oh, wow. it was so cheap. Yeah. And he was, because the idea was to get you in to upsell you the other game, the game right. where you play in the dark. But Treasure Island was a room, um, I don't know, there's nothing. This it room's was too big. small. But like, it's like. Office. I don't know. It, it had a, carpet, little piles of sand around the wall. Maybe 250 square feet oh, was wow. the size of this room. It was tiny, tiny, tiny. No emergency exit. He actually locked you in and you had to ring a bell for him. A doorbell. And get you a doorbell. And he would come in and like peek his head in. And so this whole game, uh, this is one of the first games that we played back then, you know, we, and we still kept going. Right. We still liked them. Right. But it was like a, a hole in the wall with a heat lamp, little piles of sand, some Michael's craft boxes and math and a globe. And I was like, I don't understand how to do any of this. We solved he was, three puzzles. He was doing the, the math. Three of the five. And three I was just sweating five, and five. sitting on a carpeted this floor was... looking at piles of sand. Oh, I bet. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised that they didn't, uh, not deter you, but you know, still kept going because like. It didn't I, matter. They were This fun. was so new. This right. was so interesting to us. It was fascinating. So if new players complain to us about something not being immersive enough, right. we just kind of chuckle because we're like, yeah, you we remember it. when. Right. Right. <laughs> when it was Sudoku puzzles and calculus on the floor with craft boxes. Right. Right. And heat lamps. <laughs> That's crazy. I appreciate the escape from creators that kind of use that the small space that they have and kind of like you mentioned the back of a semi truck like and how creative you can for me it baffles me still how creative people get on using the little space that they have and creating this like super intricate and like different passageways or like you know crawl spaces you're like how do they fit all that in there right and then even the, the bigger escape rooms where it's like they have all the space and they utilize even then still every single thing like there's no empty space if that makes sense and you're like as the experience and so that's 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 i envy you guys on being able to experience all that and still i guess continue right um how many speakers have you guys done in total oh, gotta check my more i don't know <laughs> i'm pushing 600 she's pushing 700 oh, wow. so what is that now i don't know what the exact the app are. knows yeah my service isn't great, but the app knows. I think you're it. My Morty score is 800, but some of those are haunts. So my escape rooms are 690, and my haunts that I have up are only 107. Wow. But I just okay. never updated my haunts, because that's a new thing on the app. Right. And it, was that the majority of that here in California, or a lot of state, <clears throat> or even out of the country? I'd say. We've played a couple in Canada, but that's the only thing we've done out of the country. Okay. Um, I mean, we've played a lot out of state. We we used to before we before we owned a business and it consumed every minute of our lives. We um, we traveled. We traveled quite a bit, and we would go to different states. And we would always we we would choose our states based on the escape rooms or, or haunts. Or haunts. Yeah, we really really, it was haunts about haunts too. was a big part. And then so. you know, as a byproduct, good areas with haunts tend to have good escape rooms. Mm. The creators are similar mm -hmm. a lot of times. Right. Um, the same people who've been doing haunts for 10 years, 20 years, mm -hmm. get into escape rooms because their audience is the same audience and they right. enjoy creating these stories and then they just 
have puzzles in them. And they're builders. They're, they're fantastic <laughs> builders. They're not always the most creative or logical puzzle designers, but they're usually incredibly beautiful set designers. Right. right. And so it makes up for it a little bit. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, um, even like the first, I think, 30 or 40 that my wife and I have done, um, whenever, because, you know, usually after a room, you're like, hey, you ask your game master, how many escapings have you done? Oh, what are your top three? I think this is before we even found out about Morty, so that's how we would um, kind of decide, okay, let's try this one next, let's try this one next. And a lot of them would be like, oh, yeah, I was like a Disney Imagineer, or, you know, I did this and I did that. And we're like, we got into escape rooms. That's and the things that they create, right? Um, so then what kind of pushed you guys to essentially, I guess, own your own escape room, create your own escape room? Fell in our lap. Well, I originally wanted to. <laughs> okay. um, a few years before we did, I had started to design a mobile truck unit mm -hmm. that I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and I had found like the vehicle I was going to purchase and everything. Um, like the next day, I was planning on going to get it, and I got this notification from a booking site that I'm on as a ventriloquist, mm -hmm. and this app called Live Me from China wanted to meet with me about becoming a live streamer. And it was an opportunity to perform. And so I took my design and I set it aside and I said, you know what, I'll do, I'll meet these people. Maybe I can do performance. It seems like I can do live streaming anywhere. Then I can just build the room. And then when I go to locations, I can still live stream. I can do both. Right. That's not really how live streaming works. <clears throat> you have to have really good like internet. You can't just yeah. do it anywhere, yeah. and it's very time consuming. Yeah. So I got derailed from my truck design and build. Never bought my truck, and then never made the room. But I had had some meetings with some people who were owners to like get their feedback and help on the design and everything. And so some people knew, and then we um, had also gotten involved with another owner. And his business. Yeah, we were, were. And so word got around yeah. to Jeff, the owner of Exit Game, mm -hmm. originally from um, uh, what's the LA location? Monterey Park. Not the Monterey Park Exit Game that used to be there, and then he has a San Diego. This was his third location mm -hmm. in Anaheim, and he's like, "Hey, Christine, I heard that you uh, you wanted to do an escape room, you wanted to build one." And I was like, ah, who'd you hear that from? <laughs> he told you. I was like, wait a minute. I don't think I was like made that public knowledge. Right. And um, I was like, would you like to look at the space that I have available? And I said, no, talk to Jeremiah. That sounds like businessy things. And mm -hmm. I'm creative. I didn't want to deal with it. <laughs> right. And so they talked a bit and we went down and looked at the space and we ended up taking over uh, a location that already had permits. Okay. So we did our own designs right. and build, but we didn't have to go through that horrible like permitting so process yeah. of Anaheim. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. tough. I don't, if it if it hadn't happened that way, we wouldn't. We'd still be involved in the other escape room that we're involved in, but that's behind the scenes. We're not creatively involved. We're not building games there. We're just partners. But um, but this was a chance for us to, to build our own and to yeah. do a, you know to. And yeah. eventually my truck design is going to be expanded into a room design. Uh -huh. So we're excited about that. So my original little concept yeah. is going to come to And it's, it's looking fantastic. I've, you know, we've been working on that now. It wasn't the first room we went with because mm -hmm. of the way that the layout of the building was. Mm -hmm. We walked in and went, what can we get open right away? Right. Like, right. We were not going, yeah. hey, can we redo the walls in here and right. get new print. We're like, nope, this is here. The walls right. are here. Yeah. What can we make this into? Right. And then that's why we went with something we were both really passionate about, which is haunted house type rooms, yeah. old school horror games, yeah. movies, well, it was a great first storytelling. Game. Right. Because the first game is really just, just a love letter to escape rooms. Everything that we saw in those early days, everything that we laughed at, everything that we rolled our eyes at. Is why all, did is the killer give the you a black light? Yeah. Right. Why did he exactly. give you a black light? Yeah. I thought he wanted to kill you. Why is he being so helpful? Yeah. So yeah. we poked fun at that and sort of thing. Yeah, and I like how <clears throat> you're playing your game, and you kind of touched on this a little bit already before, of um, usually in an escape room, right, it's like kind of just creators will try to make the puzzles work, but the story or the story work with the puzzle, right? And then kind of just 
to work with the flow, the immersiveness, you know, whatever you want to call it. And you guys are just like, let's just throw it in. Let's do it, right? And so it, we definitely enjoyed it. It was definitely different, right? Especially playing a few rooms before we did uh, played your guys's, and it was like, this is different. Like, why? Why didn't they ask for our, our, our phones? Why didn't they like? <laughs> why? why? <laughs> this is so different. And and so can you kind of just talk a little bit more about why you decided to go that route and kind of go against the norm of what most escape rooms or experiences are? There's a couple reasons. I'm really passionate about photos and videos for mm -hmm. memory sake. Mm -hmm. um, I have been blogging about escape rooms for almost a decade and there's nothing more frustrating as a person who wants to help a business grow than to have the owner or the game master say, no, you can't take photos in the room. Right. Even though like, I mean, I've played hundreds of games, I've promoted hundreds of games. Right. Like, just trust me to be able to take a photo and not give spoilers. Like, right. I just want to promote your game. Right. And I never understood why nobody would let me do that. I'm not nobody. There's exceptions to every rule. But the majority of rooms were like, no, we don't allow that. And I have to get like special permission from the owner to get photos. And I know that David and Lisa also go through that um, with the room escape artists. And like, uh, same thing with CC and Brandon. Like all of these other bloggers were always like, oh, why won't they just let us take photos? Like we can do this without giving away everything. Right. And so it was really important to me when we created our game that nobody felt that, right. that frustration of, I want to tell everybody how much fun I had and get more people to come help your business and experience the story and enjoy this game. But if I can't show them in the world of social media, they won't go. Right. So just saying, oh, I had fun isn't enough. Right. Like, but if you have a picture in that reverse bear trap looking yeah. mask, your friends are like, what's that? Right. Where do I get that? How do I do that? Right. And so we really wanted to make it so that people could essentially market for us, mm -hmm. Yeah. but because they wanted to and people already want to, they just aren't given the opportunity. Right. Um, and part of it too is that I just, you know, I have a trash memory when it comes to certain things and it's really helpful to have photos. And yeah. so like, I'll go through my camera roll and be like, oh, did you remember this? This is from like 12 years ago. I came on, I saw this photo. And I really hope that people have that experience. Yeah. And you can't if you weren't allowed to take the picture. And if it's just the picture with the logo, you're like, yeah. what was this game? Right. I don't remember this. Exactly. Yeah. So. Well, and I think part of, and, and we talked about this later. I don't know if it was part of the actual design process, but um, part of our game is really, influenced by Instagram museums. Mm -hmm. You know, this this idea that you just get to, you have these great scenes, you have these moments that you get to take photos in, and we built a lot of that. We have these these really fun moments that people like to take photos. Yeah. Um, and I think that was a big, it, it was somewhere in the back of at least her head, because um, she's, she's been to a lot of, goes to a lot of those Instagram museums. So. Yeah, well I've been doing social media, because I did end up doing the live streaming, and then mm -hmm. I ended up getting into content creation and musically and just now TikTok and so cool. I mean I've done an uh, online content creation for a long time yeah. and I know how important it is yeah. um, and I know how I've, I've been invited to these events where people are like you know you have almost a million followers like we're going to treat you like royalty right. because we want you to tell your fans and right. your followers about our event and so I know that there's a lot of value in that people put a lot of money into getting people to just share online yeah no yeah for sure so I'm like why would we gatekeep that? Yeah. Like, why do we not let people do that? That's right. weird. No, exactly. This is not, we, and our game wasn't designed in a way that it's really easy to give away the answers. Mm -hmm. There's a few puzzles, like if you see them, like you get the answer, then it's like, well, you'll know. Yeah. But you still have to do the thing. Right. Like you might see somebody working on a pipe in our room and you might figure out what they're doing, but you're still gonna have to do it when you go in the room. Exactly. You're still gonna have to get the items you need and you're still gonna have to physically do the thing. Right. And so, and then one of our main puzzles, um, that's probably one of our more challenging puzzles because it requires communication and multiple people, mm -hmm. but it's a randomized puzzle. So it doesn't matter if you saw the answer, right. Sorry. it's gonna be different when you play because it's right. different every single time it starts over. Right. Um, so, you know, like there's that, aspect of our game that makes it 
a little bit easier for us to be like, yeah, take right. videos. But yeah. we designed it that way. Right. So if people are designing games that are not something that they can allow a photo of, I kind of understand they don't want spoilers out there, right. but also people are not going through going, oh my gosh, let me just show all the answers. Right. Nobody's doing that. Right. I mean, somebody must be somewhere because that's what everybody's afraid of. So there must be one guy out there, one girl out there that's just going around yeah. recording all the answers and putting them online to right. ruin the games for everyone because that's clearly a fear. I think right. when the industry was new, <clears throat> people didn't know what to do. For whatever reason, mm -hmm. one person decided in the very beginning that you don't show photos, that you don't allow phones. Um, and then everybody just kind of followed suit. Uh, the industry's changing, changes every, you know, every day, everything, every day things seem, seem to, to, to adjust and yeah. evolve and all of that good stuff. But I think what's so funny about, especially the fact that we're under the Exit Game name, uh, one of the, probably the company that was the most strict about phones in the beginning was the original Exit Game. Oh, yeah. To the point where he would even want people. You would want us, and we had to lock everything. You didn't have it everything away. Any and now metal, basically. We allow everything. Right, right. Yeah, well, no, not weapons. Please don't yeah. bring weapons. No weapons to the game. Oh my gosh. If you pull out a knife in the game because you just have it on you, like, put that away. Yeah. We're not wanding you, but, like, we don't need you to have that out. Right, right, <laughs> right. And, and, and it's funny because I think. Um, and you spoke about this a little bit about the basement. Um, how I forgot there was a YouTuber that um, I forgot what his Chino? name was. Mark Flyer. Oh yeah, Mark. Um, yeah, where he kind of recorded a little bit of um, I forgot which room it was. And I think when we approached it, when we finally did it, we weren't like, oh, like this is this puzzle that they did, or this is what they saw. Right? It was more like, I want to see that. Right, I want to. I want. I want to do what they're doing. I want to, you know, experience exactly. that, that interaction with the actor. And and it's and it's interesting that you guys mentioned just the the all the hard work, right? Because there's a lot of work that goes into the design, and just some are so beautiful and intricate. It's like, how could you not allow someone to take a picture with your work, right? Um, as a creator, right? Usually, it's like, hey, yeah, this is for me, obviously, but also to kind of share with others, like for others to appreciate. So it's like, how would you? Why? Why wouldn't you want someone to take a picture? Even with just like a, one of the beautiful backdrops right and um which leads to my next question like did you guys design your rooms to have just such like awesome like cool backdrops and you know when people are taking pictures or recording or is that kind of just like kind of work along with it well we wanted everything to look good right <laughs> i mean i don't know right. what what do you mean like christine naturally has an eye for how photos are gonna look okay she just does and and she doesn't understand that not most of us don't have that. I don't understand why people don't take good pictures but, all the time. Um, but she can look at a room and know how to, to set things in a certain right. way because she's already thinking about what photos are going to be taking, taken and where they're going to be taken. Right. It's, just just... How, it's just how her brain works. So to answer your question, yeah, there was something there. Whether or not it was – we didn't sit there. We didn't sit there and say, hey, we need to make sure that this backdrop looks really good for photos. But it was already there in her head, right. and I and I know in the cat game that's being designed now, um, when we were, you know, kind of spatially figuring out where things are going to be, mm -hmm. she was already saying, "Well, the photo is going to be better here, so this has to be here." Right. Okay, this so I was like, there. if we do, if we put this prop right in this area, it's too close to the door, and the door will take you out of the reality of the space. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to probably need to angle it because otherwise there's not enough space to get a good photo of a big group. Right. Like it, it just is a thing that I, yeah, I just do it. It's kind of subconsciously like. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's pretty rare that I explain to anybody why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm right. just like, this is how we're doing it. Right. That was just a different case because I was talking out loud to him about like, cause I'm going to need somebody to help me um, build that prop because it's a bigger thing and it's going to have to support people to climb up on it. And stuff and so I was like oh I need to make sure the door is big enough but not too big right. for like structural reasons but right. then also for photo reasons and lighting right. reasons and so that was the thing I was talking out to him about but normally I just go oh no we're gonna move it over three inches mm -hmm. and I know why instinctually but I don't think about it from like a again it's a creativity thing like I'm not going oh let's measure right <laughs> I just 
definitely struggle with the measure twice, cut once concept. I'm just like, eh, there, screw it down. No, I was wrong. Hold on, the lighting's wrong. Move it over. Right. Take those cement anchors up four inches that way. And so everyone's like, why are we moving? And I'm like, because the lighting's better. <laughs> Right. Like, well, we could change the lighting. Okay, that's fine too, but right. it's not gonna be poor, like poorly lit, terrible shadows. Because how are people gonna take good photos right. or visually see it like right. they're in a movie? Yeah. And I think that's part of it too. It's not even just about the photos. It's just that I want to feel like I'm in a movie, mm -hmm. and movies are cinematic and they're done through camera lenses. Yeah. And so I'm looking at it like as if I was looking at it through a camera lens. Right. But I'm. I'm the lens looking out. Right, right, and it definitely helps with that um, immersiveness, right, and how, like, I don't say how real, but how, like, into it am I, right, how, how surrounded I are, the ambiance is. Mm -hmm. And and so, um, which leads to my next question, of how, how important is it to you guys as a player, or even as a creator, is immersiveness when completing an experience? I want my games to be immersive. I would rather have immersion than puzzles. Okay. Um, I know there's a big debate, and certain industries changed yeah. to be an immersive industry, and I think the puzzle people don't like that. There's a place for puzzle-heavy games without a lot of immersion. Mm -hmm. They're not my favorite games, mm -hmm. but there's a place for them, and there are people who enjoy that. Yeah. It's just like, I don't really want to watch murder documentaries. But a lot of people like that. Right. Like, I have friends who can tell me everything about Ted Bundy, and I don't <laughs> care. Because it's not my interest. My interest is to be, to have fun. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and my version of fun is to feel like I'm in a story. I'm actively taking place yeah. in this experience that's happening around me. And, and I'm the lead character. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's for all the lead characters of our life. It's that lead character energy. But it's that, that thing. And for me, with a puzzle-heavy game, I, a lot of times I'm like, well, I could do that at home yeah. in my living room. Right. And I would have the same satisfaction from doing a Sudoku puzzle book than I would from this particular game because it just felt like a bunch of puzzles right. that I could have found in a book. Right. And so that's not my style of game. Right. There's a place for it. Right. Well, and we're we're at our core. We really um, we're we're we created the business for people to have fun. Yeah. That's all we care about more than anything else. And in our what we've seen is more people have fun when the immersion's high and the puzzles are light. <laughs> you know, most people aren't puzzle people, and they don't need to be. The the masses don't have to be really good at puzzles, but they do have to be engaged. And so we really strive to make something engaging, but not to the point where we have to hand somebody every couple minutes. Right. Um, because that, that's not fun. Right. We didn't want to make our game difficult for enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. That wasn't our goal. Right. Our game was meant to be challenging enough for the average player, immersive enough for everybody, right. and having little Easter eggs and nods to enthusiasts yeah. so they felt they were also in on the joke. Right. That they are, they understand the world that we built. Right. New players don't necessarily understand the world we built. Mm -hmm. They get a couple of the jokes here or there. Yep. I think everyone can agree math doesn't belong in an escape room written in black light. Uh, right. Somebody thinks that's a good idea. Right. We thought it was funny. Not a good, not necessarily a good puzzle, but a funny one. Right. And, right. you know, so that's why we have things like that in the room. Yeah. But it definitely, it, the newer players, especially young new players, mm -hmm. like the teenage crowds that come for their birthdays, they want to come and get scared. Yeah. Our room is scary enough for them. It's yeah. not, it's not too scary. No one's getting tased. You know? Yeah. No one's getting caught and drugged down the hallway and tied up in another room. Like, right. it's not that scary. Right. It's just scary enough that, you know, the 13 year olds are like, we can scream and run and still have fun and not, yeah. like, freak out. Yeah. Um, and so they're there for kind of a different reason. They're there for the immersion and the fun, where I think our more enthusiast players who enjoy horror come and they're just more in on the joke. Right. And they enjoy it and it's immersive. But again, the puzzles are not so challenging for them that they're like taking the full time necessarily right. where our new players do right 
but we still wanted to have something in there for them to enjoy in a different way because we weren't building that enthusiast mm. hardcore puzzle game right that yeah. we have played <laughs> at other places and yeah. we hear you know on the tropicalists and things and we're like good for them right those are difficult games so what are you guys' thoughts on um like spooky or i guess scary games right because that's how it's kind of differentiated even in morty that kind of in order to bring that scare factor i don't want to say bring like pain but kind of like that shock literally right um do you think that that's i don't know not and not dissing or you know hating on on those games or the creators but do you think it's over the top or do you feel like it's more for i guess the really extreme like hey i need to feel pain to feel alive type of enthusiasts so i think i think it's a cheat i don't think there's anything wrong with it mm -hmm. we we designed our game knowing that we cheated with the story because we can explain anything and, and I there's nothing wrong with that. But by using uh, shockers, it immediately instills a different uh, level of fear that you're never gonna get because there's real consequences. Yeah. And, um, and that changes everything. It's not a game that we would ever design. It's not even a game that we enjoy playing. No. Okay. But I don't we, know if we've ever played anything with shockers, have we? In the arena. Oh, that one so, in Vegas where they locked you in the room played, with no release, yeah, and we, I had a. We played the one in Vegas. Ooh, I was not happy. We he played, got locked in a room and there was no way out. Murico, but they it, never but. actually shocked us in Murico, but they did have yeah. the little shocker. Um, no, we haven't played Arena yet. Mm -hmm. We um, she um, she's got arthritis in her neck, okay. and um, at the time Nathan and Emma told us that. There was no way to play the game without wearing the shock collar, so we should probably just not play it. Um, so we have it. I would play it if I found a group, um, but uh, we, I might. We I don't have, I'd have to talk to them and research what kind of shocks it really is. Yeah. Um, there's different types of shocks. Some of them stimulate muscle tension and things. Yeah. And if it's using that technology, then it wouldn't be dangerous. Right. If it's literally a dog shot collar. I'm not sure that's safe. Yeah, yeah, well, there's definitely a few times I was like, huh. So, <laughs> yeah. have to, I'd have to like, but I just wasn't interested enough in being shocked. Right. Um, right. We had some pretty bad experiences in haunted houses with okay. shockers, okay. but we don't really enjoy them. Right. Yeah, we did a blackout maze where you, you put like a bag over your head yeah, and you yeah. just go through the maze. Oh, wow. Um, it was... But the walls were rigged with shockers. What was the haunt? I forget that. It one. was Rob... Rob, Rob Zombie. Rob Zombie came to town a few years ago and he made three houses. And this was the Lords of Salem haunt that he made. Uh, it was... I mean, his, his whole thing was fantastic. It was yeah. great. I wish he'd bring it back, but... But I just hung on to him um, and he touched yeah, out in front of him. To... And kept getting shocked and really didn't like it. And yeah. I hadn't really had a bad experience with shockers because I'd never gotten really very shocked right. until Vegas. And we went to Freakling Brothers and they have the chains hanging down in one of the haunts where they're all full of the electricity. And so if you touch them, you get shocked. Yeah. And I happened to move one out away from my face with my wrist and yeah. I have carpal on my wrist. And so when it hit me and it shocked me, it gave me that same tingling feeling that I get when I wake up in the morning and I just froze and I just stood there being shocked and yeah. I wouldn't move. And this poor actor had to shove me to get me to move because I just I went into physical like yeah. Yeah. shut down and shock. Right. And I was just like standing there like this, <laughs> like my arm up and yeah. being on a chain shaking. Right. And I, I was just like, I, I can't yeah. move. Right. And so after that, I was like, I don't think I like these. Right. right. So it's just, I don't find them fun. Okay. And it's all about fun. Right. So why right. do something that's not fun? If you had a game design that was an entirely crawling tunnel game, I would also not find that fun mm -hmm. and I wouldn't play it because right. I don't want to crawl that much. Right. Yeah. Right. So. Right. But yeah, people like it and good for them and go play it. Well, I think there's a place for it. Right. I really do. And I'm glad that um, that it's there and people love it. Uh, people, you know, the response is always great for those games. And I think um, once the adrenaline starts pumping and, and, you know, and the body's just into it, it creates a different level of immersion and that's great. 
And I think some of them are really creative. I mean, I never would have thought of Arena. That just would have never been a, a story I would have thought to tell. And, and that's so creative, that the way that they came up with doing that. Right. So that's awesome. Right. And I'm bummed I haven't seen it, but also I don't really want to be shocked. So Anything that pushes the industry forward, I'm all for. Right. Um, as long as it doesn't create real danger and cause the industry to get shut down, mm -hmm. you know, you could take it too far. If, you know, the rust of escape rooms comes in um, and wants to make a McCamey Manor type escape room, and it starts making things unsafe and starts bringing bad press. No, right. I'm against that. But if you want to up the immersion by having shockers, yeah, 100%, I'll support it. I may not support it financially by going there, <laughs> right. but I'll we'll send people, people there. Right. We tell you know? people all the time yeah. about Zoe and yeah. Murder Co. and Arena, like uh, all of these different games. Uh, there's more, but. Right. Yeah. 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 So, what other. What other um, aspects, I guess, do you think creators out there, in your opinion, right, um, either new creators or just uh, creators in general, what other aspects can you add them to make it, I guess, as adrenaline rushing besides, you know, um, physical, the physical aspect of it, I don't want to call it pain, because, but. I mean, um, that gets pain. Well, I think Minotaur is a perfect example of that. Minotaur, um, even though, yes, everybody gets hurt. Um, but it's not because of the game. I mean, yeah, it is. But it's because of your friends. It's because of... They've created a game that I thought was actually very, very safe. A very well-trained actor that still created real fear, yeah. you know? And, and so, uh, Trapped in a Room with a Zombie did the same thing. Trapped in a Room with a Zombie did do the same so, thing. So, and I don't know if you remember Trapped in a Room with a Zombie. Some people think it's a, one of those, like, urban legends... But it's a real game that people really played, okay. where we were trapped in a room with a zombie on a chain. It came out of a cupboard, and the chain got longer as the game progressed. Oh, wow. And if the zombie touched you, you were done. Oh, wow. Um, there were versions of it where you could get back into the game by right. doing things like the chicken dance or okay. whatever. It was very okay. fun. But you could get kicked out of the game if it was like tag. You're, you know, you got tagged. You threw out. Yeah. Um, Right. And I think that's what happens with Minotaur a little bit. It's because there's it's consequences. It's that fear there's of the still, consequences yeah, right. of actually being caught versus right. a game where the actor comes in and they're chasing you, but you know they're not actually going to touch you. Right. They're never really going to hurt you or do right. anything. Right. So they have to then sit there and try not to catch up to you. Mm -hmm. Which I actually had that happen in a haunt this year. <laughs> where we had uh, some vampires chasing us through a yard. Yeah. And I was just not about to go quickly through the yard because of the uneven ground at night. And I'm like, I'm not gonna fall and hurt right. myself. I yeah. sprained my ankle in Minotaur. I'm not gonna be doing this sort of thing, you right. know? Like, and so I was just like walking carefully. And these these vampires are running after me in like slow motion. <laughs> Once they got close and realized I wasn't gonna move any faster. Right. Yeah, the poor butcher had to do the same thing. I was like, everybody go. Sorry, yeah, I'm a little slow. Right. So there's no consequences yeah. right. there. But with Minotaur and Trapped in the Zombie, like there's or consequences. Eddie's original silence. I think Eddie's original. And I don't know if he still does it, but oh, Eddie's original know. silence. You had to wait in the corner for five minutes. Yeah. yeah. He caught you. So if there's consequences involved, yeah. it makes the stakes high enough. I think for most people mm -hmm. that they don't want to be taken out of the game. Right. And there's pride there too, like they don't want to get caught. There's, there's you know, your pride gets hurt right. if you're the one, unless you're like sacrificing yourself for your friends. <laughs> like, yeah. you, you're like, oh, I was too slow, and then your friends can also make fun of you. Ha ha, you right. got caught by the zombie. Right. So, you know, it depends on, I guess, who your friend group is. Right. <laughs> but I think in general, it's, it's just storytelling and how well you can do your storytelling. Um, you can still create fear without even consequences, mm -hmm. but it's the difference between watching a slasher film and a slow burn mm -hmm. horror film where the the eeriness just begins to build up and really get you and get under your skin or you're watching a bunch of blood splatter yeah um i think for me the unknown is a little more um heightened fear mm -hmm. than like gore for example okay. so i think some of the scariest, most adrenaline rush type games that are out there in the LA market mm -hmm. are Weeping Witch and The Orphanage. 
And I would say that the majority of people that I talk to disagree with me. They would say Zoe mm. or Murder Co. are scarier because there is a chance you'll get shocked. Right. They don't want to be shocked. Right. But I'm not even going to play the game that I don't want to have the consequences of. So why would I play that if I didn't want to get shocked? Yes. I know what's going to happen. So I would rather play a game that I feel safe enough that I won't get injured. Right. But I find scary in a different way. Yeah. And it's that sort of setup and the waiting and the knowing it's coming. Yeah. When is it coming? Yeah. Oh, it's coming now. Right. Oh. And then there it is, and you're like, ah, uh, yeah. as opposed to a game where, you know, there's just people chasing you. Right. Oh, no, but they really can't do anything. Or people who are going to do something that I don't want them to do, like, ah. Uh. Right. Um, so I think those are scary, and that, that the way they tell those stories. And I know you think Weeping Witch is very scary as well. In the structure. In the structure. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't scared, but I understood... Um, I was unsettled at my I understood, like, on paper, that game is, is almost perfect when it comes to scares because they built it out um, as if they were writing a story and they built the scares perfectly into how that story unfolded yeah. um, and wonderfully, wonderfully done. And I think that that is a very scary game if you allow it to be. Yeah. Um, I'm also always kind of unsettled or scared by the the unknowingness yeah. of like putting your hand in something. Mm -hmm. Like when games have those moments where you have to reach in and feel or find something, and it's like, right. what's in there? I think you do it. <laughs> I don't know if I'm yeah. gonna do this. Right. It's you know they're not gonna have like a real bear trap in there or something that's gonna like close and take your hand off, but. Right. That's why we have that. What game. if it's fuzzy <laughs> <laughs> and you're not expecting fuzzy? Then you're like, ah, yeah. there's an animal. Of course, there's not an animal. Right. But it's that your imagination. To me, I guess, and maybe it is something to have to do with like the creativity type personality. But mm -hmm. to me, the unknown is scarier and more intense and more adrenaline and rush. It's all of those things where I don't know because my imagination is going to get carried away. Right. Where if it's right there in front of me. It's not as scary because right. I know it's fake. Right. Because I can see yeah. it's an actor or I can see it's a prop or it's fake blood. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, but yeah, I do like the consequences of being caught because you don't want to not be able to play. Right. And so do you think then having that stake of whether it be, you know, um, in some cases, right, being put into a different location than your group or not being able to play for a certain amount of time or just even being... Kick, not, I don't want to say kicked out, but just not being able to play at all kind of add to that immersiveness? Or do you think, because um, I, we were talking, when we would talk to game masters, like, hey, what's your favorite game? But oh, you know, try this one, but, but there's also this, so be careful. But, and it was that aspect of, you know, hey, like I paid for whatever, 60 minutes, I want to get those full 60 minutes, but if you do this, you know, you have the possibility of, you know, if you mess up whatever, 20, 30 minutes in, then you don't have to be able to play the rest of it. And so do you think it's, I don't know, if it just adds that immersiveness or just kind of may even deter some people to just not even want to try that room. Well, I'm going to address something that's exactly something you said, but not what you're asking. Okay. First of all, enthusiasts who want to get their 60 minutes worth, mm -hmm. that's kind of a ridiculous ask in the world that we're in now. If someone is building their game for an enthusiast to get their 60 minutes worth, most of the time, the average player can't get out right. and they can't even get close right. and it's not fun for them. Right. So if you're building your games for the small community that is enthusiast only and you are not allowing your average players to get out or have fun or even get close, yeah. That's not a very good business model because right. you got to keep paying the rent. Right. Yeah. And I think when enthusiasts get mad that they don't get their 60 minutes worth, it is a bummer. I get it. I used to feel that I we all go through that phase. But eventually, I think most of us come to the understanding that if you're not getting out in like 45 minutes-ish, right. 
there's either something they're doing that's keeping you there right. so that you can continue to play and yeah. that's okay that's a that's a design that's cool um but the, it might just be the games aren't well designed because mm. you can't figure it out yeah. and you're just sitting there or you're doing a ton of busy work right for no real good reason right you're not moving story the story forward you're just kind of stuck in a place because enthusiasts are incredibly skilled and knowledgeable. And they should be getting out quickly in most well-designed games mm -hmm. because they are good players. Right. And they're not gonna get their 60 minutes worth once they get good at it. Right. It's just like you're not gonna spend as much time playing a video game to get to the end of the video game because right. you're not gonna die as much because you're good at it. Right. And they forget that. They got good at it at one point. Yeah. And then they're mad that they're good at it. Yeah. It's like, don't be mad. <laughs> You're good. Right. Take the win. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Like, but yes. Uh, but it leads me to one, uh, my next question is, um, I've noticed at least, and um, I don't know how, at least here in California for, for a lot of rooms, and I don't know about out of state or out of country or whatever, but uh, as kind of, you know, time passes on, I've noticed that escape rooms are kind of moving towards that immersive what's it, immersive experience all right not necessarily escape rooms where like hey you lock in a room do a bunch of um do a bunch of puzzles or locks and then boom you're done but more of okay you have to play along with the story and i guess it kind of i don't want to say feeds into the enthusiast if i need to get my time's worth but you're kind of not not forced but you have to play along and you have to go with the story and because of that you know you get your full time's worth of whatever that may be and so do you think that's something that that's kind of where the industry is going of more not escape room but more immersive experience i think an immersive experience that's great right i think it is and you can see it uh Terpica's list this year pushed out a lot of the big puzzle games at least the socal puzzle games um i think yeah of course it has it's the natural evolution it's escape rooms have to be for the general public um so you get a game, you get like wonderful creators like Adam, Jonathan, and, and Ben from uh, Ministry that created a game that they wanted to tell a story. They knew they could get everybody out. I mean, they 100% they went in with it with the idea of we are going to get everybody out of our game and we give them 90 minutes. And they did, and, and they get For to... For people who are listening and don't know the SoCal area <laughs> as well, it's Hope and oh, at yeah. Ministry of Peculiarities. Yeah. That's who we're talking about. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. They're amazing. Fantastic. Good job on Fantastic. Terpica. Fantastic. We hope you're around yeah. 50 years to become number one. <laughs> yeah, right. They'll so, understand that. So they, they're they slowly getting their way up the list. Right. They Every moved, year they move one up. They moved one <laughs> up this year, so. <laughs> They were very, very... But... But they, they get it. And I think that's where the industry is heading. Right. Um, people are, some people don't like it. Um, you know, I think kind of uh, what your question was hinting at uh, before your previous question, I think there is a point where immersive can get too far. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you have a bomb in the middle of your game and you decide to do the wrong thing or you make the wrong decision and then your game really is over, um, and you don't get to see the rest of the game. Right. Sure, it's immersive. Is it fun? No. Right. And, and that's that's what we, we still have to be fun. There's a game in SoCal, and I'm not going to say anything about it because I don't even think people fully understand that you get to make a decision. But in the beginning of this game, you get to make the decision that you could just walk out and you could actually beat the game. Oh yeah. That's that's the game. You don't have to play the game. Actually, you're not supposed to play the game. You, you make the wrong decision by playing the game. Interesting. Um, is it fun to walk out of the game just so you can actually be the winner? No, of course not. And the, the creators will let you go back mm -hmm. and play the game. But you don't always know. Yeah. And that's part of the, the adrenaline rush, though, right. is that you don't know. So yeah. if you get caught by a creature or a zombie, will you be out the whole game? Right. Or will you get to go back in? And I think that's where the, the real fear comes from, is that I paid for this experience. What if my friends get to keep playing and right. I'm stuck in this little like closet by myself the whole rest of the game, just sitting here waiting for them and I'm bored. Right. 
And that is a real fear. Like you don't want that to be the case. Right. And I think in good designs, they don't actually allow that. Yes. They yes. give you the fear of it. Mm -hmm. You think that's the actual answer or the, the truth of the situation. And then you find out it's not. Um, but yeah, it would be a bummer if like, you like screwed up the second puzzle in a game and the room like fills with like fog and you're like, game over, you died. Right. And you're like, it's been three minutes. Right. What happened? And Patrick That's played different. with that. Uh, Evil Genius, um, it's been long gone, but the game kind of moved up north. Uh, but he, he played with that in his third game, the morgue. The morgue, mm -hmm. you do something and all of a sudden you don't have the time you thought you did. And um, he plays with it and it changes, it, things evolve and, and the story continues and, you know, whatever. But he does. There's he messes another with another company you. that's game is going away that we love. They're friends of ours that has a, a moment in their game where if you do a thing, your time mm -hmm. goes down. That's what made me think of it. Yeah, theirs is a little more comical. Yeah. Um, and we won't say it because it's still up and running locally yeah. too. So, But once it's gone, I'm sure everyone will talk about it. Right. All right, um, so then can you kind of walk, I, you kind of um, did a little bit already, but continue to walk us through your creative process, especially now since you are you know, continuing to build new games, of uh, how you, just, that creative process of building it, right? You do like story first. I know you mentioned that, hey, like everything just has to visually look pleasing to, to the eye, right? And so is that kind of like the, the stable, hey, this needs to be, it or like more story first since you both have that background or you know can you kind of walk us through kind of what is the process of, of how you create your escape rooms well for the first game we already have walls up that we were working with right. so i think we mostly just went through looked at the space and said what can we do with this how can we decorate it to make it fit a theme mm -hmm. like what what were they going to do when they what did they have in mind right and then kind of take some of those ideas and make them our own. Um, and then we came up with the story, the, the premise, not the story, but- Well, I came up with the premise pretty early on yeah. because I, because we had his old plans for what he was gonna put in there. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it and I said, and nothing against him and his plans, but I said, this, that is, tunnel. this is just another cliched Game. With crawling, so much crawling. But I said, what oh, if what if we crawling. took that and we made the scream of escape rooms? What if we took mm. what he was going to do, amplified it, and knew that what we were doing was kind of overused, overdone, um, and had fun with it? And that's how it it began to the story began to to come come alive. Well, we we pretty much came up with like a concept of like this is the idea. Right. And then we went and we made a list of all the different types of puzzles that were cliched and all the things that were cliche yeah. in old horror games. Mm -hmm. Like we just made, we made that list. We're like, what do we, I think we even went on Facebook. It was like, what do enthusiasts hate? What's the worst thing you can see in an escape room? They're like, right. black light. We're like, black light, too much black light. Right. Crawling, we're definitely gonna have crawling. Although not too much, cause I really do genuinely hate crawling. Yeah. Um, and then, well, and it's unsafe if it's too much because you've got to have sprinklers brought. There's like a whole thing, mm -hmm. like it's a thing. Uh, and then just padding it properly. Yeah. But anyway, so crawling, when there was, um, I mean, there was just so many things that we yeah. just, math. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were like Sudoku. Uh, there were things that we didn't put in the game right. that we were literally like, we don't know how to make this fun. Right. Journals and Sudoku. Are Journals. The, are the two that didn't make it. Did not make it in. Yeah. Laminated paper did not make it in our game. No laminated paper. Um, so there were things that we were like, no, that's too far for us. Right. We're even not going to poke fun at We just, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we made that list and then we were like, well, how can we, and we went through the space and we're like, how can we put these and divide these up into the rooms in a way that make it a, a good flow, yeah. an equal amount of puzzles and experience. Um, how do we put the easier puzzles at the beginning and then build and build and build with story, uh, lights, sound, and then puzzles structure. Yeah. And how do we make it feel like uh, the structure of a horror movie? Because that's really, he's the expert when it comes to like horror movies and horror movie structure mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how to tell that kind of story because he's such a good writer when it comes to that style right. and knowledgeable. 
And then I think after we came up with the puzzles, we finally sat down and did the final, like, here's the the real story, the intros, the hints. It took us a hints. while to do the actual we scripted everything. Whole story because I had it, I had it actually set up in a slightly different way in my head. And she was the one that turned the killer into the one that was self-aware. It really helped put it all together. Right. Um, but I wanted, He doesn't know he's goofy. Yeah, I wanted... We know he's um, goofy. I wanted a, the actor does, though. a character amazing. that was on your side that was kind of stuck there. Mm -hmm. um, kind of, well, in, not to spoil a 30-year-old movie, but um, kind of like um, Jamie Kennedy explaining the rules of a horror film. I wanted that type of character mm -hmm. um, where we ended up kind of getting more of a stew character. And it worked out well. It still worked out really well. Right. Um, so. Yeah. Um... So then in the, well, then of course you do the, we did nine weeks of beta testing. We did a lot of beta testing. Oh, okay. Um, and he was our killer. Jeremiah was our killer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then we got an actor to be the killer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Thank everything, because we were like, oh, we need to get some, we have this pool of professional people around us from the industry, like, why wouldn't we use it? Right, right. Which, it's so funny, we get so many people who will be like, oh my god, your video at the beginning is so good, he's such a good actor, where'd you find him? I'm like, I'm Fast and Furious. <laughs> like, he's a, he's an actor, he's right. a legit actor. Right. It's not that hard to hire legit actors, to be honest, right. to do acting work. Right. They like doing it. Right, yeah. It's, it's hard to get, you know, when, when it comes into, like, the types of unions and all of that. Like, there's a little bit of, like, red tape, I guess. But you can find some really good non-union actors locally in your small town that right. does theater right. that would be good in your video. You don't have to have an animation right. that's, like... Or five core actors. But... Or five core actors. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. But, I mean, I'm just saying, like, somebody's in, like, Colorado and, like, Littleton, they may think, well, I don't have access to those L.A. actors. They, but they, they can get their local community actors yeah. and still be good. Right. It's sort of that, that animation. And nothing against that company that does it good for them. They do it well. But that animation, I'm, I'm over it. Like, get a good <laughs> intro video. Um, anyway, so back to design. The current game we're working on, we're doing it slightly different. We came up with the theme. Okay. I already had a bunch of the puzzles because yeah. I'd already yeah. kind of designed it. Uh, we came up with the theme and what story we're going to tell. And now we're like, how do we fit all of the puzzles into the story in a way that is logical enough because we don't have the benefit of the person who built that the killer is an enthusiast built an escape room right. we don't have that benefit this time of just whatever we want to do we'll pull it off right. now we have to make it fit a little better and so we're kind of working on how do we fit these in how do we make the world feel as real as we can still a little cartoony and fun we don't want it so real that it's like not fun yeah um because you're still trapped so we want people to like enjoy it. Um, and then we're kind of going on like the prop and design set look um, to make sure that it all fits aesthetically well together with the way the puzzles are designed. Right. Um, taking into consideration, allowing photos and video in the room, what, you know, how, how many puzzles are gonna be puzzles that once you solve it, if, it's, if you see it on a video, it's not fun anymore. Mm -hmm versus a puzzle you may see somebody do, and then you'll still want to do it. Right. Um, I'd say we also really go into it with the mindset of, a lot of this is gonna change. Oh yeah. You right. know, that's really, we learned that in the first game. We, we had to just let go of things and, and, and pivot and mm -hmm. do a different way to do the puzzle. And even though it made sense to us, it doesn't make sense to other people, and that's okay. Right. And that's, that's one of the big things that I think, just going into this, we know, we know it's going to change. Yeah. And it's you know. the hardest part, I yeah. think, for designers mm -hmm. and builders is that you are passionate yeah. about the thing you're creating. Any type of art. You're passionate yeah. about your art. Stand-up comedians. How many times have you watched a stand-up comedy show and there's that one joke and you're like, I don't think they're ever going to stop telling that joke and it never gets a laugh. Right. But they love that joke and they're right. keeping it in their set. Right. And a comedy club, you go, you're drinking, whatever, like, you can get past that one mm -hmm. joke. But in an escape room, if there's a puzzle that does that, or a moment, it can really kill the momentum yeah. 
of the game and you have to be less precious about the things you came up with yeah. and be willing to change right. which is actually something we're doing on a bigger a scale, scale. Mm -hmm. because the second game that we're working on now is not the second game we've been working on mm. we recently decided to pause the build on our actual second game and start working on the third game oh okay because our second game, anybody who's listening that's talked to us over the past year knows we're working on a space-themed game. Right. And they're like, cats? What are you talking about, cats? We don't remember you saying anything about that. Right. That's because that's our third game. And our second game is really ambitious. Right. And we're not quite to that place yet. We're willing to just let go of the ambition yeah. and just make it to get it open. Right. We don't want to compromise the quality of the vision. Right. So we had to pivot. Right. And we're working on a game that, that I've been really excited about yeah. for years now, yeah. um, but is a much easier build. Right. And we're just kind of like, well, how can we get this done quickly? Because you also have to take into consideration when you design, how long is it going to take? And yeah. that's not really something we the, the end of the day, well. you still have to make money. Yeah. You know, yeah. as much as you want to create something everyone's going to enjoy, and it's going to be super fun, and it has all these great ideas. If you're not making money, you, you can't keep making it. Right. Um, and that's hard. That's hard because yeah. you just want to do what you want to do, what the vision says, but you, know, you yeah. got yeah. to eat, got to pay rent. Yeah. And you know? so yeah. for us, we didn't judge the second game, mm -hmm. the, the time it would take, the amount of money it would take, mm -hmm. the amount of skill it would take right. to get everything done, right. and just the amount of videos we're going to have to make. Like, There's so many things yeah. that it just keeps like, we have a list of, we have to do this, and we're like, oh, but wait, what about these other 30 things that we didn't put on the list yet? Right. And then it just keeps getting bit to be a bigger and bigger project, and we don't have a full team of people, so we have to make the decision either we pay a full team of people to right. come and try to get this done, right. or we do it ourselves, and it takes longer, yeah. and it's cheaper in its own little bubble, mm -hmm. but when you're talking about rent and staffing yeah. one game, it's not. Yeah. And so I think that's a big thing that designers have to take into consideration is right. if you have a really big ambitious game that you want to build and you have the vision and you're good, you're ready to go, like, is it going to get built fast enough to help you pay the bills? Or is there another game that you can do first that right. you're less passionate? Was... I guess I'm not less passionate. I'm still very passionate about yeah. the, the second game that's coming now. Um, and I'm really excited about that world, and I'm really, it, but it's just a simpler world. Uh, and I like things to be kind of straightforward and simple when it comes to like entertainment, not in a bad way, um, in a childlike way. <laughs> like, I'm gonna enjoy that Disney princess movie yeah. over some Marvel movie any day. Right. Because right. I can't follow Marvel. There's too much going on. The, yeah, that's... Whew, yeah. And so, for me, that's kind of the worlds that we're building. We've got our space game as, like, a Marvel universe. Mm. And then I want to build, like, the Disney Princess movie right. over here that's just straightforward. Like, somebody's going to be a hero, somebody's going to be a villain, and we're all going to have fun watch it happen. Right. Um, and so, I think that's why I'm really excited, but it's also easier to build. Yeah. Because it's... You know, and, and we our first game's pretty much like we don't have a lot of excessive props and mm, right. um, red herrings and things in our game. We it's a very straightforward game too. Yeah. So then, do you think as creators that are setting out to do something, um, obviously there should be goals of what you want to hit, but do you think that there should be, um, I guess, kind of like a definitive line of okay, this is where I'm not satisfied, but just kind of like, I'm okay with how it is, right? And then kind of move on to the next thing. Or do you think as creators, you should, I guess, have that, that, um, that, 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 that line of, okay, I'm good here, and just let's still kind of build from there. Well, I think that's, you know, it's the million dollar question, right? You know, um, people have crazy ideas, and that's why we have all the technology, all the wonderful things that we have now, a bunch of people saying it couldn't be done and then somebody failing at it over and over and over yeah. again. Yeah. Um, until it was finally, they figured it out. Uh, I think, I think you have to ask yourself, what's, what's more important? 
Is it more important that your, your wild out there idea actually comes to life right now? Or is it more important that you keep yourself afloat and the business stays afloat? Um, and you do what you do. I think ultimately, at the end of the day, unless you just have endless resources, you do what you do uh, to keep the business afloat without compromising too much. You know, you don't want to compromise to the point where you know you're going to get a bad Yelp review or a bunch of bad Yelp reviews. Or, you're gonna or that it's not off fun for people. people. Not, yeah. yeah. Our bottom line is to have fun. So if we look at it and say, this is not going to be fun, then yeah, we're not going to do it. We're going to find another way to make it fun and still make it come out. But um, but I think, yeah, I think there's nothing wrong. And I, I think you can see that. You can see that with a bunch of creators that have oh, yeah. put... A, Maddie you know, and Luke, they update their game all the yeah. time when they have the energy and time and resources to go back in. And it's been... The well, way for a while at Crossroads mm -hmm. in Anaheim. Yeah. Um, for the Hex Room, I mean, we've played the Hex Room four times. Four times. Five, four? Only four. Okay, four times. Yeah. And it's been different like three of those times. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> because they just keep going back in with new ideas and refreshing it. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I am very much of the opinion in life in general. Mm -hmm that it is better to get something done than to get something perfect. Mm -hmm. um, that was a hard lesson for me to learn and once I learned it, I just I went with it and that has made my life better yeah. in so many ways. Um, as an actor, I have to get headshots done. Mm -hmm. If I try to get the perfect headshot, I'll never have a headshot. Right. Like my picture will never be perfect enough for me to go there is, this is the perfect photo. Right. Everyone will hire me. Right. Um, I am happy 100% right. with this thing. Right. No, there's always going to be like, oh, why is my eye a little bit closed on that side? Like, what was my hair doing in that? Like, right. And then you don't want to Photoshop it because then, ah, then it gets yeah. weird. Then you yeah. turn into an Instagram model. So, like, there's right. always that thing. So, at what point can you go, that's good. Some people will really like that. Right. I'm really castable in that. Right. I'm going to send that out. And if it doesn't work, I'll do a new one. And that's kind of how I feel about everything I do, yeah. including our rooms. Like, right. let's get it done to a point that we're happy enough and people will come play it. And if they have fun, then we succeeded in the goal. Yeah. The goal isn't to make the perfect game. Right. The goal is to make a fun game for people to enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard, I know, for a lot of people to not, like they want things to be perfect. Right. <laughs> but I'm not gonna sit there like and rewrite my holiday card envelopes because I misspelled somebody's street name. I'm gonna scratch it out, write the street name, and get it in the mail. Yeah. And that's how I live life. Right. <laughs> and I think that's just a good life lesson for everyone in general. Right. Because if it's perfect and not done, right. then it was never done. Yeah. If you wait right. for that perfect moment to propose, you may never get married. Right. You know, like, right. just get it done. Yeah. Like, but don't suck at it. Like, don't make it sucky. Right. Like, if it's really bad, do it again. Right. No, yeah, for sure. Uh, can you tell us about a time where, you're, when you were experiencing a room, and just, and obviously, right, your game, uh, just make fun of these of where just the, the things that you typically see in escape rooms, but you, you saw and you're like, wow, that was a really creative way to do this certain puzzle, but obviously, you know, to make it unique. Yeah, we saw it this morning. Christine sent me, she oh, found yeah. some, um, a a TikTok of a, of a I'm stealing room. that idea. And, um, <laughs> this, I'm gonna make it my own, but I'm gonna so steal it. So simple, it was just a simple, you know, simple feeling puzzle. Mm -hmm. But this guy threw them in oven mitts, and so the oven mitts shut, and you had to feel the numbers and try. Wow. And it was really clever. It fit with the theme, yeah. you know, because they're oven mitts, because it was a, um, it was like a baking game. It was a Christmas game. It was a Christmas game, game where you're baking okay. Christmas cookies. Um, but it fit. And it was simple, and, and it was clever. Feeling puzzles are hard, because how do you really make a box? People are still going to go inside. But having something so self-contained was, was really was really clever. And I it's really from 60-Minute Missions Escape Room in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, and Murraysville, Pennsylvania. 60MinuteMissions.com. If they you go to their TikTok, TikTok <laughs> they had a really creative feeling feeling puzzle. Because normally I feel like feeling puzzles are like, 
in a box or on a wall. Yeah. They're, they're not mobile. Right. No, this so was clever. I was like, that's, that's so cool. Yeah, this and was really clever. I really right. enjoyed watching and that. Those are the kind of things yeah. that just make you, you know, kind of spark up and right. see that there yeah. still is different ways to do the so skill. Yeah. But I'm 100% trying to figure out how I can steal that concept and put it into the cat game. Right. Because I want to have so many of our props to be mobile and to be able to um, take them out and put new versions in if we want to yeah. change the game up but have it be similar. Yeah. Uh, and so I was like, ooh, what if I didn't use oven mitts? But I used something else, and I don't need numbers, but I could use shapes. You like, so there's right. all of a sudden there's these new ideas coming and being sparked from somebody else's creativity. And I just love when puzzles make me feel that way. Mm -hmm. Like they inspire me yeah. to want to make a cooler version yeah. uh, or a different version. Like right. his version is very cool. And right. for a holiday game with elf spaking, it's perfect. And right. it's as creative as it, it's awesome. Right. But I don't need oven mitts in my game. Right. So, like, how can I make it? work for what we're doing in a totally unique way yeah. where people aren't like, oh, you just stole his puzzle because yeah. we don't want to do that. We don't ever want to just directly rip off anybody's puzzle. And I think that's also why people used to not let phones in the room mm. or photos because they don't want people to rip off their puzzles and right. create their own version of like their game. Right. Um, but I think it's an honor when someone comes into our game and they see this pipe puzzle that I came up with and they literally are like, that guy told Jeremiah, he was an owner from overseas, and he's like, I'm going to put this in, in my game. And he was like, okay. And I think I think that's an honor. Absolutely. Like, wow, wow, you think that that's something I came up with is cool enough that you want right. to rip it off? Right. Awesome. Right. Like, that's cool. Yeah. Try to find your own unique, to, unique way to do it, but what else? Like, right. that's cool. Right. And so, like, yeah, but we like inspirational, like, ways that people do stuff. There's tons of creative ways people take an old concept and make it new. Yeah. The only one I haven't seen somebody do a new spin on is smelling. Boy, oh, somebody needs to come up with a new way to do a smelling puzzle at this point. Yeah, not I have them. <laughs> For real, I, I get nose blind after, like, three different yeah. scents. I'm like, I tell my wife, you, I this is all you. I have the hardest time with scent puzzles. I, we played a game with some friends a couple months ago now. And I opened up this box and I was like, Sid Puzzle, I'm not doing it. <laughs> like, <laughs> not it. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. Well, as we close out this episode, I have to ask, um, in no particular order, okay, um, top five favorite rooms. It doesn't have to be in state. Uh, certainly Ministry, the Hope Inn. Ministry! Um, Peculiarities, they're so good. Weeping, so good. Weeping Witch over at Crossroads. Uh, the Grand Parlor, uh, 13th Hour in Wharton, New Jersey. That was one of my favorite just experiences in general. Um, Cutthroat Cavern in Baton Rouge because, it's, you know, it's an amazing game. It's an amazing set. Um, he created something really special there. And then number five... Uh, Let's get my room. Well, probably Minotaur. Oh, I would say Minotaur would be number okay. one. Because Minotaur was really a blast. I had such a good time in, yeah. in that experience. Such a great room. Christine? Oh, gosh. I mean, we have a lot of the same favorites. Okay. Ministry, I 100% love. Um, I love any sort of, like, real immersive game. Um, I really enjoyed Escape My Room because they have a game that you don't use sight for. Like 90% of the game, you're in darkness. Oh wow. Okay. And it's so different and unique. And I love that. But I also love their lobby at the building mm -hmm. in general. Like everything about that, when you get there and you have to figure out how to get into the lobby. Yeah. Like it's just so good. Um, I mean, I love everything at Crossroads. But Weeping Witch is really, really cool. I actually, I really like Psych. Um, psych Ward? Yeah. <laughs> it's because you won. I did win. I like to win. Um, no, I really liked it because yeah. it was so different. Yeah. And um, I wasn't offended by being in a Psych Ward, even though I have a lot of mental health stuff as a creative person out there in the world we often do. Right. Didn't find it offensive at all. Um, and I liked the Easter eggs of the, of the people who were in it that were the doctors. We knew a lot of them because they were owners. Mm. So that was fun. But that's no longer around. Um, 
Oh goodness. Um, so many. I just, it's just so hard. I don't want to forget somebody and then have them be like, oh, she doesn't like my game. It's we can do honorable fun. mentions. We can do honorable mentions. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I definitely, um, Crossroads from somewhere. Um, uh, Ministry, Escape My Room. I mean, Dwayne's games are incredible at, um, in Baton Rouge. Um, I can't even pick a favorite out of those games. I think, I think probably the prison game. The, is it Death Row? I think is what it's called. I think he called it Death Row. Yeah. And then I don't like prison games. Mm. Like I really don't like prison games in general. They're like my least favorite. Mm -hmm. Like there's offices, museums, and prisons that I just, I'm like, oh, that's the theme? Cool. Have fun. I'll right. sit out here. Right. Uh, and I, I loved that game. It was really different. Um, uh, Minotaur was fun. I mean, I like, I like all the 60, like, ah, uh, and I love the, the, um, oh gosh, Quest uh, Tavern. I love Quest Tavern's uh, Final Supper. Oh, Last Supper. Yeah. I like that so much with the, the actor in there, but all of the, the quest rooms are also good. I don't know. This is a lot of games. Oh, yeah. They're all like. Yeah, that's difficult question. Ah, but I think my absolute favorite. And in the basement. Oh my god. Uh, like yeah. the basement Where with the, the courtyard. courtyard. Yeah, wow. And that first time we'd ever seen an actor used the way we saw the actor used in, um, uh, no, in um the study. Oh, the study, yes. Mm -hmm. To have that type, type of puzzle and interaction with an actor yeah. that we'd never seen that. That was right. so... I think it's more moments than rooms yeah. Yeah. that stick with me. Because right. mm -hmm. I could say, like, it's there's like 300 amazing games that I could talk about. But the ones that I'm like, oh, if it's a favorite, I think I had a favorite moment. Right. Yeah, because even in Wharton, we love that game. But the moment I remember most at thir 13th. The grand parlor at 13th hour. 13th hour. So the grand parlor is the one that was like really cool with the like levels and the yeah. thing. But the moment I remember was the list that I got from the other game. And I don't, oh. I don't want to say which one it is, but I, uh, they, they went onto like my Facebook and pulled like people from my friends and family. And I and there's a moment where I discovered that, and I was like, that moment got me, right. or that moment in that sixty out game where our photo was in the room um, with where he had to kill the fish. Oh yeah, that was fun. <laughs> is that game still around? It is. Oh, then I don't want to say. Yeah, it's, okay. It's on its third on. You'll, it, you'll know when you play it. It's but still yeah, around. so yeah. But um, but yeah, I don't know. There's a, I just named a lot of them. They're all yeah, up there in incredible lands. But you'll hear. I mean, you'll always hear me talk about like Minotaur and the same ones that he listed. Ministry, Crossroads. There's a bunch. I I liked Murder Co. But we played it through three owners ago, mm -hmm. so we didn't play the new version. Okay. But I think the important thing is, like she said, it's those moments. Mm -hmm. We remember moments. I would 100% say my favorite virtual game that I played <laughs> was in Prague. Yeah, the catacombs. The catacombs. And I would love to play that game in person, mm -hmm. even though we've already played it virtually. That was probably one of my favorite, most memorable games. We played it again. And it was during the pandemic, right. virtually. Right. But like, how, it was so fun. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, and Exit Game on the Sea is really fun. Of course, she, of course. The Thirteenth Basis seems like a really fun game. Yep. I haven't played it yet. Haven't played it. Check oh, it out. Really good.